Welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. This podcast brings you enlightening discussions with leading experts and public figures directly to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. Today, I have a very, very, very exciting participant at our podcast today, Ms. Biljana Sirakova. She is the EU Youth Coordinator at the Directorate General for Education, Youth, Culture and Sports. Hi, Biljana. Hello, Tess. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. It is such a pleasure to talk to you as well. Um, I have prepared quite a few questions because, of course, I work with youth as well as you do, and um, specifically the European Union. There's so much going on, and I'm sure that the young people listening to this podcast, either on Apple, Spotify, and on other channels, or watching us on YouTube, want to know a lot about how you work and how they can get involved. So if you're ready, I would start with my first question. Sure. So, dear Biliana, let's start with a very, very important topic. How to make the European Union more inclusive? Well, it is an important topic for us. Um, Tessie, I have to tell you, inclusion, it's one of the three priorities that we have, uh, digital, green and inclusive. And it is something that, um, we, that we try to integrate across all EU policies. Mm -hmm. I can first speak about our mobility programs because um, many, maybe some of your listeners have taken part in an Erasmus uh, Plus exchange mm -hmm. or uh, are thinking about it. So Erasmus Plus, but also our youth program European Solidarity Corps um, have been renewed this year. They have an increased budget mm -hmm. and they have been made more digital, green and inclusive. And why is that? We would like that many more young people across uh, the European Union have the opportunity to participate uh, in these programs and to benefit from them. Um, so how we are doing that, the criteria have been changed. Many more youth organizations are allowed in and there are certain other practicalities, but we, we have made changes to make these programs uh, reach uh, a bigger number of people. Um, for this inclusion perspective, we're also working very closely with different stakeholders because at the end, I think if we want to be inclusive, we need to understand what are the needs of these groups that we are talking about, whether we want to include you know, young people with disabilities or young people with fewer opportunities from migrant backgrounds, whatever uh, we are talking about, I think at the end, it is they who know best what are their needs, and they will be the ones who have the solutions uh, to, to how do we address the, the challenges they are facing. So we have to work very close hand in hand with the different stakeholders, with NGOs, platforms, networks that are representing them, and also with authorities at you know national, regional, local level. So this is some of the things that we are working on. That is really, really exciting. When you talk about budget, just out of curiosity, what are we talking about? Well, it's it's a bit uh, difficult to quantify because we have so many programs. Uh, and again, um, some of the uh, actually fund is available at national level or regional or local. So I do not know if I can, I don't think I can give you one figure on kind of this inclusion, inclusion dimension. I mean, as said, I think when we have, you know, these priorities, the point is that you integrate them across the board in every action, in every new project, in every initiative. And this is how you really embed them in the process. So they are not a specific side program that has a budget to attach to it. It's mm -hmm. almost like a, a, a mindset and you want to see it all through the board. So it, I don't think that there is a specific number to it. No, but it's, I think it's fantastic that the European Commission is really investing in our young people of the European Union, um, because there's many. How many young people are in the European Union, in your opinion? Well, the, uh, the, I mean, it depends also, you know, on what the definition we use, because, you know, in the Commission, for instance, or the European Union, we have a different definitions, for instance, for the UN. But um, for our kind of statistical purposes, we, when we talk about youth, uh, 
we talk about 15 to 29 years old uh, people. Mm -hmm. And so as a group, you can understand that they are facing very, very different challenges. I mean, for instance, we are talking about youngsters who are, you know, in still in school. Uh, so maybe things specific to education, digital education right now, or studying online, maybe, uh, you know, uh, something they're interested about. But then when you talk about people who are, are after maybe their university studies, um, you know, transition from education to employment is a big point of interest for them. And having these quality opportunities to enter the labor market or so quality trainership and, um, and help in, in making this transition. And also other things like housing options, etc. come to mind. So there are many different challenges for this group. Uh, they're not a homogeneous group um, at all. Wow, very, very interesting. So um, one question that leads into also your short introduction. Um, there's a project, a new project you are launching now, which says, which talks about green track. So ready to get on the green track. What does that mean? Yes, yeah, so it's a new project launched by the Director General for Environment. And um, I just want to uh, back up and start to say that um, I think we, we not all agree that young people have very good ideas. They have a lot to offer in mm -hmm. terms of original solutions, very unique perspective of how to address challenges, for instance, as climate change. And, uh, and energy and then kind of courage and boldness to speak up, voice concerns. We see this in the youth climate movement. So um, not only for this issue, but others, we would like to hear from young people and make space, create platforms where they can voice these concerns. And not only you know, to have these listening exercises, but also collect actually tangible ideas and then follow up uh, so that uh, there is actually some action taken as a result of that. So on the Green Track campaign, it's uh, about the virtual uh, train and you can see it uh, if you Google and find it, that will be collecting ideas from young people linked to environment and, and climate action. And, it, and then these ideas will be served in a way at the, at the end of the track when the train, the virtual train arrives, will be served to policymakers who can then take action based on the, on the different proposals. Very interesting. So um, when you're saying that you're collecting these messages uh, mm -hmm. and policy suggestions from young people from 15 to 29 year olds, how can they reach you? How can they submit these? Does it all go then through a specific tab on the website? Or do you also work with schools, universities? Yes, we do work with a lot of different uh, stakeholders. So our kind of one-stop shop for, for youth um, is the European Youth Portal. Uh, so you can easily find it. Mm -hmm. And their young people, and actually not only even from those ages, uh, there may be some materials that are relevant even beyond these ages, uh, can find, um, you know, uh, information about these programs that I mentioned, mobility programs, learning abroad programs, volunteering, etc. Uh, they can find also information about our, hopefully our upcoming European Year of Youth 2022. Mm. Uh, there will be a map of the different events that will be taking place as, as a result of the year. So uh, people can orient themselves and see what is available to them. And this is, and there is already uh, a way to introduce their ideas. We started a couple of weeks ago, uh, kind of a co-creation process for the European Year of Youth, because we do not want this year, it's not an EU year, uh, it is a year uh, co-created with young people and new stakeholders. So we have launched a short survey to already start asking them some questions of what is the year they want to see, what kind of formats, what kind of events and initiatives. And this is only the first step uh, in the, basically the coming month, there will be uh, the additional portal launched specifically on the year. So I would direct everyone to this portal because it's a very good first step to, to start. Wow, that's really interesting. I make sure as well I put a link of the European Youth Portal in our, in our show notes. Then um, a question that is close to my heart, obviously, the topic of kindness. Um, mm -hmm. On Saturday is International Day of Kindness, mm -hmm. the 13th of November. What is the European Commission doing about it and you specifically as EU Youth Coordinator? 
Yeah, that's a great uh, word. I don't think, uh, interestingly, as a word kindness, I've seen it in any of our, um, uh, you know, kind of communication and paper. And I think it's something that uh, is it, we have to really think about. When we talk about what comes to mind is, um, we talk about a lot about volunteering, of course, mm -hmm. and this is the big uh, um, program that we have, European Solidarity Corps, where young people can uh, apply and volunteer, uh, uh, whether it's abroad in another uh, EU country or locally, uh, for a community, for different projects. Um, the new thing in the new program I mentioned is humanitarian aid, uh, which is now integrated, so they can even volunteering activities well beyond uh, Europe. Um, so this is the, the thing that uh, comes to mind. But I think this, I mean, the importance of kindness and uh, also comes to mind when you think about giving back to a community. I mean, for me, active citizenship is about that as well. You know, I always say that being an active citizen is it's kind of a, a two-way thing, a two-way street of give and take. And so we, uh, many of us are fortunate to have to receive a lot, uh, whether it's from our society, from our parents, from our schools and communities. And we live in a continent and in countries uh, where we receive a lot. I mean, I think we have a lot to be very thankful for. So it, uh, for me, what comes to mind is how do you give back, uh, whether it's to, to a cause, to a, a person, to a community, uh, how do you make the contribution uh, to a society? How do you make a positive uh, influence and how do you make change? So this is what comes to mind. And for me personally, uh, working in this institution, the European Commission and the EU, um, I believe in that. I mean, I think I believe in the project. That's why I'm here. Uh, a common good uh, European project. And uh, maybe kindness is something that in a way is at the foundation of it, right? Um, cooperation. Uh, being kind to each other and, and working together to, to face all of these challenges that we have. That's beautiful. So at the European Commission, kindness is one of its core values, kind of what you're saying, which I which is something I really love because I think with the pandemic that we have been in and all of these different lockdowns and everything, I think kindness has been really um, on the forefront uh, of discussions for many organizations and many people around the world, really. Um, we have seen it, for example, by people putting little papers on the, the neighbor's doors that they didn't even know before, uh, just to say, hey, I'm here for you, stay safe, I do your shopping, whatever you need. And these adds of the definition of kindness, right? As you say, with volunteering as well, kindness is doing something good for someone else without expecting a return. And I think yeah. that, is, that is a beautiful act of service. Um, and, and I'm happy actually to see that such values are also championed at the European Commission. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for that. And if I can say, Tessie, I mean, you said it's, it's exact, of course, it's a service. I think it's also a, a little bit self-service. I mean, there are also studies that suggest that, you know, when you are positive uh, towards others and actually do good, good deeds, there it's, it acts like a boomerang and comes right back at you. Uh, and actually, you're, you can be more successful and more happy, you know, uh, actually giving uh, and having, uh, you know, and doing kind thing for others. It's, it is something that works in your own interest at the end, which is quite amazing that it's such a win-win. Absolutely. So the next question then, um, the European Youth Event, EYE. What is it? So the, this event is organized by the European Parliament. Um, uh, we in the Commission also have a similar event, European Youth Week, which next year will be the, the year. But uh, this is organized at the Parliament, and it just happened now in October. Uh, it took place in uh, Strasbourg, although uh, a big number of people joined uh, virtually. And this is linked to something I already mentioned, uh, the space uh, to meet young people, that they also meet each other, they connect to like-minded individuals, they, but also not so not different people. And so that they, they form these relationships and, and get in touch. Um, and importantly, that they have the space to meet uh, policymakers from the EU institutions. So uh, the event takes uh, many youth uh, organizations take part in the event, and it is mostly for young people. They have debates, they have discussions, they argue, they propose ideas, 
um, and make recommendations. So as a result of the youth event, there is a, a report with recommendations then which is reviewed by, by policymakers. So it is a very high energy events. And when you when I said that young people have a lot to offer, I think anyone who has ever attended this event will absolutely uh, agree with me. And I can just say that uh, if you didn't have the chance, many of the uh, sessions as part of this European Youth event are recorded and are available online. So I think you can as well Google them and, and find them. Oh, perfect. So online as well, I assume, at the European Youth Portal then again. There will be a link, yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So talking about youth then yet again, um, now that you're saying, you know, next year will be the, the year of youth, of young people, mm -hmm. um, what is the youth participation in the EU really? And um, what do you expect from next year's year to the youth? Mm -hmm. Um, is it also, is it kind of like framed like TEDx talks, if you want, where you can use kind of like a frame that you can, what, how people, a box, a frame they need to use, and then they can do their own events as well in different mm -hmm. countries, because mm -hmm. everyone coming to Brussels, maybe not possible. Also, online is maybe also not always so fun. So people say, well, can we also do events in our schools or in our communities, wherever we're from, from, uh, from different youth. yes yes yeah absolutely maybe i'll start with that and then i'll talk about youth participation yeah. yes as i said this year it's not a eu year of youth it's european year of youth and most of it will really happen at at the local and national level in the countries so we uh, this is we are will be working very closely with national authorities every member state has appointed a national coordinator for the event and they will work uh, nationally with schools with teachers with networks with um, youth councils because every member state normally has a national youth council which is like an umbrella organization that has members of uh, many other youth organizations in the country. So all of this will be happening at, at many different uh, levels. And um, I said on the portal, there will be a way for organizers who are interested to, to uh, deliver an event in the framework of the year to input this event. Uh, they will receive some information of uh, and communication materials, how to structure it. And of course, they'll be asked, you know, the purpose of the event and uh, so that we make sure that it contributes to the objectives of the year. Um, let me say about youth participation, because actually it is one of the objectives of this year to promote youth participation, especially when it comes to young people who maybe are have not been so far very engaged. Um, in youth, our biggest youth participation mechanism is called EU Youth Dialogue. So it happens in these 18 month cycles where a, a, one cycle is dedicated to one or two of these uh, youth goals that we have, 11 youth goals, mm -hmm. which by the way, were not uh, something that the commission or the institutions have come up with. They were designed in 2018 with the participation of over 50,000 young people throughout Europe. So the, these 11 youth goals is what young people want to see in the future uh, of youth policy. It is not uh, our kind of goals, but we have committed to, to work towards those goals. And so um, every youth dialogue is concentrated on advancing one of the goals. And what happens there is that, again, at all different levels, there are different event, events, debates, workshops, projects that are taking place all uh, on this thematic. Uh, and as a result, and also there are debates in, of course, in the in the council and the, in the institutions. And as a result, with that, there are concrete actions proposed that are, take place after that. So this is the the youth participation mechanism that we have. But um, we are looking for new ways to improve participation, and some of them have to do also with digital new formats of participating and, and how do we include uh, citizens in these decisions. So for instance, we have uh, ongoing the conference on the future of Europe. It started in May and will last for one year. And there are a few things there, but there is a digital platform where any European citizens can go in and introduce their, an idea that they have something that they want to see in the future of Europe. And there are different themes there. Uh, you can contribute an idea linked to education or climate or migration or any other issues that are important. 
Uh, linked to that, organizations are having um, debates and conferences and events linked to the Conference on the Future of Europe. And our objective is that um, many young people take part in this conference. Then there are citizen panels, uh, plenaries that are taking place. And all of the EU institutions, the European Parliament, Council, the Commission, have committed to follow up from this one year long conference um, and to, uh, to follow up on the suggestions of, that people have put forward. Of course, uh, it's so difficult because we are receiving thousands and hopefully will be millions of contributions. So in terms of the digital platform on the back of it, there's artificial intelligence and there is a mechanism to try to group all of these many, many different ideas and kind of um, get the essence out of them, combine them in some kind of uh, trends or themes in order to be able to actually analyze uh, the information. But we think this new, because this is the first time that we are doing this, uh, it's a kind of a direct democratic exercise without any intermediaries, without any uh, your opinion being passed on by another person, which is, of course, very valid. And this is what politics is about. But it is a direct engagement with citizens. And I personally believe that in the future, this probably will become more and more the norm. And I'm, I'm happy that this is happening. Um, I think, though, it has to be accompanied by a lot of efforts in terms of fighting disinformation and promoting this kind of active citizenship and citizenship education because it is great that you know we are opening and asking for people's ideas but we also need to build up the knowledge uh, and the capacities um, and and share the information so that um, we don't have uh, certain decisions that service that uh, can be really counterproductive sometimes to people. I think this is partly what happened with Brexit, right? So there is sometimes can be a, a, a danger in leaving everything to the people. I think we have to do it, but it has to go hand in hand with the process of fighting this information, educating people, uh, and again, supporting the citizenship. Fantastic. Wow. Well, I'm really excited about all of these projects. Um, we have run out of time as mm -hmm. this is just such an important topic. So I will make sure I put all of the links below and uh, make sure everyone knows where to find the different informations and how they can get involved, no matter who they are. And um, also the parents who get involved, the teachers, the mentors, and also corporates, of course. All this is a whole collaboration exercise for Europe, which is really fantastic. So um, thank you so much, Biliana. One last question before I leave you. What is one of your most favorite books, quotes, or podcasts that you would leave us with where you say, people, go get it, listen to it, or um, check this out. This is something that really inspires me. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, Tessie. Not to... Um... Um, you know, mention competition because I think it is not competition, but I'll mention a podcast, uh, which is called Lights on Europe, uh, because uh, my perspective today has been from the EU institutions, uh, Europe. And so this is why uh, what I want to mention. So this is someone, uh, a lady who is very passionate about all of these topics that we also discussed. So this is what I would recommend to your listeners, Lights on Europe podcast. Thank you so, so much, Biliana. Well, this is it. Thank you so much. As you can hear, my baby just woke up, so I'm going to attend to him. And um, yeah, wish you a beautiful rest of the day. For everyone listening in, please subscribe, comment, like, and share. And speak to you all very soon. Thank you for your time, Biliana. Thank you, Tessie. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this Zoom o'clock. We hope this discussion was insightful and has provoked some new ideas for you please share and subscribe. If you like to keep in touch with your host, you can find her on Instagram under Tessie underscore from underscore Luxembourg and on Twitter under Tessie underscore DE. <laughs>